This is the apex of college football. And once again, the national championship will run through the SEC. It's territory the Alabama Crimson Tide are quite familiar with. They've been the gold standard since Nick Saban took over in Tuscaloosa. But dominance within their own conference has eluded them during Georgia's historic and current reign. You know, having the opportunity to play in the SEC championship game is fantastic. We're obviously playing one of the best teams in college football. It's going to be really important for us to do what we do the best that we can do. Several have tried to three-peat in the modern era. None have succeeded. As the Georgia Bulldogs attempt to rewrite the record books, their biggest roadblock of the season is straight ahead of them. I have a great appreciation for this game because how hard it is to win in some of the greatest venues and environments. But they got really good football players, they're well coached. You've got to have confidence that you're going to make more than they're going to make. It's a titanic clash for the SEC championship, and everything is on the line in Atlanta on CBS. Alabama and Georgia meet in the SEC championship for the fourth time this decade. The previous three all ending in Georgia heartbreak. But can the dogs end the Bama curse? John Talty and Jordan Hill are here to break it all down. Huge college football playoff implications here with Georgia ranked number one while Alabama on the outside looking in at number eight. A win for the dogs likely keeps things the same. But if the Tide win, the playoff selection committee has some tough decisions to make. Now, the Alabama-Georgia connection runs deep, most obviously with their head coaches, Nick Saban and Kirby Smart. Saban, 4-1 and one against his former assistant. Those wins coming in two SEC title games and the 2018 National Championship. So, Jordan, what's at stake here for Kirby against his former boss? Well, it's hard to believe I'm saying this, but you think about the success Georgia has, it's still something of a proving ground for Georgia. You know, they won that national championship uh, back in January 2021, uh, actually January 2022, you think about the fact uh, that they didn't have to deal with Alabama last year on that undefeated run. Uh, I think people understand that, you know, what would have happened had the Crimson Tide been able to get to Atlanta. Uh, they lost that game to LSU that allowed the Tigers to play Georgia in the SEC championship game. I think that this is a chance for Georgia to prove that it is the premier program in college football. You know, we've seen Alabama seem like early in the year we could count them out. You know, they struggled, saw a really poor performance on offense against South Florida, but they turned it on. And I do think that this is an Alabama team very much capable of beating Georgia. Georgia has to show up ready to go. Georgia understands that it has never beaten Alabama in the SEC title game. I think that is something that the players are taking to heart, and they want to try to accomplish that when we get to the game on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, the storylines are, are just, you know, kind of write themselves in this game. And I think it, you have a man in Nick Saban who has really had a stranglehold over college football for more than a decade and going up against a man who feels on the verge of doing that. You know, Georgia having won the last two national championships, uh, you know, the win on Saturday would ensure a spot in the college football playoff would, of course, knock Alabama out. And it feels like a potential moment of kind of two ships passing in the night where Georgia could, I think, make the clear argument that they are the top program in college football and Nick Saban, of course, trying to hold on, trying to get Alabama into that playoff after missing last year. So I think there's a lot between these two guys that know each other well. Uh, Kirby is the most successful Nick Saban protege, uh, the one who I think has been around him the most, the one who I think fully embraces the kind of process grind that Nick Saban's made famous. And so really good opportunity for Kirby to uh, further stamp his uh, impact on college football. And, you know, Nick Saban, who turned 72, or this year, you know, trying to get maybe that one last title or at least a one more shot at a playoff of a win here. Let's talk about the quarterback matchup. Carson Beck did enter the Heisman conversation at some point during this season, but he's coming off season lows against Georgia Tech. Meanwhile, Jalen Milrow seemingly breaks the new Bama school record every week, and his legs could be the difference in this one as Georgia has struggled against mobile quarterbacks. But, John, starting with you, how do you see Milrow performing in this matchup? Yeah, I mean, we've seen Jalen evolve a lot over the course of this season. Uh, and I think you saw moments of that against Auburn, you know, where there's some things that uh, he can do that are really special. And of course, that fourth and 31 uh, touchdown is not going to be forgotten for a really long time. And so Jalen is a very dangerous quarterback. We, we saw 
what Kirby Smart said uh, earlier this week, you know, comparing him to Lamar Jackson, which is obviously incredibly high praise. And, and Jalen is just one of those guys where he can beat you with his arms and he can beat you with his legs. And the, that's just very dangerous uh, to have to defend against. And I think what's interesting about these two guys and Jalen and Carson was that, you know, both of these two teams had some questions heading into the season. I think the big question for both was at the quarterback position. And I think Jalen and Carson have both just grown so much as players and have had again both of their teams in this spot right now where with a win they have a very good shot to make the playoff uh and ha you know potentially compete for even more beyond uh this weekend you look at georgia and carson beck you know when you look at the numbers in that georgia tech game i think that was more a matter of the injury situation for georgia i think they tried to play it safe kind of went back to some old school football against georgia tech just pounded the rock Kendall Milton, Dejon Edwards kind of leading the way with a bunch of really big pass catchers out for Georgia. Carson Beck, uh, people sort of forget at one time he was an Alabama commit. Uh, that's been several years ago now, and he's been with the Bulldogs for quite some time. Finally gotten his chance to play, and he's really lived up uh, to really any expectations, any reasonable expectations Georgia fans would have had. Done a very good job of facilitating the offense, getting the ball around, distributing the football. Uh, to me, the key for him is just to settle in um, to play well early, I don't think Georgia can afford to have a slow start. You look on the other side with Jalen Milrow. You know, we, I think when it comes to Georgia, they understand they cannot allow him to keep plays alive. Uh, he can move so well, and it's not so much him scrambling, but the fact he can keep plays alive, let receivers get open. Saw that uh, on, on that fourth and 31 against Auburn. Uh, the fact he had so much time, he waited for Isaiah Bond to get open, made an excellent throw. Georgia understands they've got to bring pressure. They've got to make him uncomfortable because if not, he could have a very big game in Atlanta. Well, Jordan, you mentioned how the injuries impacted that Georgia Tech game. So let's get into that. Lots of injuries to keep an eye on this week, specifically to skill players on both sides. Jordan, what are you hearing out of Athens? Yeah, I mean, there was real concern, especially coming out of the Georgia Tech game with the guys who did not play, Lab McConkey, Tate, Ratledge, Ra Ra Thomas. You know, looking at those guys, Brock Bowers as well. I think Brock Bowers will play. I think that Tate Ratledge will be back the starting right guard. Ra Ra Thomas has got a chance. The biggest question to me is going to be Lab McConkey. Uh, he's been hurt throughout the year. Back injury early, early in the year. Wind up having an ankle injury in these last few weeks. He, to me, is the biggest question. You look on defense. Jamon Dumas Johnson got hurt in that big win against Missouri. I do not think we're going to see him. He's been dealing with a fractured forearm. And then Julian Humphrey, kind of the next cornerback up outside of the starting lineup. He's been dealing with an injury to his clavicle. I'm not sure we're going to see him, but they would definitely benefit if he is able to come back. Probably wouldn't start, but when you consider how dangerous Alabama's offense is, you kind of need all hands on deck in the secondary. Yeah, on the Alabama side, they're in a bit better position uh, than that kind of long list of injuries that Jordan just rattled off. I mean, I think defensively, two of the guys that you look at, Deontay Lawson and Jalen Key, both of them played against Auburn, but were not quite at 100%. Uh, expect them to play against Georgia, but we'll see kind of uh, where they're at and what Alabama does, um, you know, defensively, whether it's shifting some guys that, you know, Jihad Campbell played a good amount against Auburn, looked really good, a little bit of a faster option. And then on the offensive side, the big ones, Jace McCullen. Uh, we saw him in crutches after that Auburn game. Nick Saban said he's been dealing with injury really uh, all year long. I do think he's going to play, but uh, might, probably not going to be at 100% effectiveness. I think the positive for Alabama is that you know they are very deep at running back. We've seen uh, what Rodell Williams has been able to do all season, and then they've also got some you know guys like Jam Miller, Justice Haynes. It, it's a pretty deep position uh, for Alabama. But but Jace has been a really you know, key part of their offense and, you know, not having him uh, at 100 percent if he's able to go is still certainly a blow for that tight offense going against what's going to be uh, the biggest challenge defensively they've faced all season in Georgia's uh, strong defensive front. So Georgia coming off that close win against Georgia Tech, Alabama coming off an iconic but close win against an Auburn team that had just lost to New Mexico State. The Tigers, John, also ran the ball really well against the Tide. So are there any types of concerns for these teams heading into this big game? And, John, you can start us off. Yeah, I think, Grace, you hit on it there. I mean, the thing that would concern me uh, if I was Alabama or an Alabama fan is just the uh, way – 
that Al, that Auburn was able to effectively run the ball against uh, Alabama. You know, I think that they were able to kind of do everything that they really wanted. And I do think there's, and Alabama players talked about it after the game, but they were just getting some looks that they really weren't either expecting or just really hadn't seen a lot on film. And so, you know, knowing Hugh Freeze and his offensive abilities, I do think he probably saved a couple of looks for Alabama that gave them problems. But, you know, Georgia's a team that's able to, you know, effectively run the ball, and that's going to be a real challenge. Uh, we've this Alabama defense has been very good, but seeing what they did uh, against Auburn is a question for me. And then on the flip side, offensively, uh, late in that game that we're always going to remember just that Milrow touchdown. But before that, two three and outs for Alabama in big key positions. And so that would be a bit concerning for me uh, when going against this Georgia defense. Do they have the offense that can make those big plays? You know, going back two years ago, having guys like Jamison Williams and John Mechie were huge in that win over Georgia in the SEC Championship. I don't know that they quite have a playmaker to those abilities of those two guys. So it's you kind of have to look around and think who can make those big plays. Jalen Miller is obviously one of them, but we'll see whether it's Jermaine Burton, Isaiah Bond, two guys of some Georgia ties, whether they're able to make those big plays. Looking at it from the Georgia perspective, you have to worry about the run defense as well. Georgia Tech had a lot of success, so much so after the game that safety Javon Bullard basically said, Look, we cannot have another situation like this if we want to get where we want to go, if we want to follow through on this opportunity to win back-to-back-to-back national championships. To me, that's the biggest thing. They have got to stop the run, and part of that does involve Jalen Milrow because Haynes King, Georgia Tech's quarterback, had quite a bit of uh, success running the ball, some of those design quarterback runs, as well as a few scrambles along the way. Other than that, to me, it's just turnovers, and that was a situation that kind of played itself out in that game at Georgia Tech. Te- uh, Georgia had an opportunity to put the game away early in the fourth quarter. It was right outside the Georgia Tech goal line. Throw, uh, Carson Beck throws an interception that keeps Georgia Tech alive. It was a two-possession game at that point. Georgia holds on, but it's a situation we saw sort of play out in the Vanderbilt game earlier in the season. You can't let teams hang around, even if they're inferior to the point of Vanderbilt and Georgia Tech or a team as strong as Alabama, because if you have mistakes like that against the Crimson Tide, it's probably not going to go your way. Georgia has won 29 straight games. That last loss coming to Alabama in the 2021 SEC Championship. We'll see if the Tide can pull it off again. John Talty and Jordan Hill, thanks so much. And a reminder, the SEC Championship kicks off at 4 Eastern on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. But for more leading up to the game, check out Bama 24-7 and Dogs 24-7 for all your Alabama and Georgia football and recruiting news.